And hello, my fabulous students. This is your favorite teacher, Mr. Jacobson. I am excited to be with you today. Today, we're going to talk about colonial society and economy. So we are in Unit 2 of the A-Push curriculum. We're going to talk about the uh, how society looked, look at the social aspect of things, and of course, the economics. So let us begin. All right, so we got a bit of a population growth happening here. Um, in 1701, we have English colonies, and we're barely reaching about 250,000 Europeans and Africans. However, by 1775, we see a massive spike happening in about 2.5 million people who are now uh, settling and living and, um, and working in the, uh, the colonies, right? So African-American population increased from about 28,000 in 1701 to about 500,000 in 1775. Um, not all of that was African um, slavery migration, if you will, forced migration. There were laws passed that uh, made it so that um, Africans inherited their mother's slave status. So because of that now you have children who are being born into slavery um, rather than them having to transport more and more uh, African slaves over to fill the demand. So, so we, we have a, a, grow, a growth happening as never before in the, in the colonies and that's going to change things significantly going forward. Now the reason for some of this growth is you got immigration happening, happening with about 1 million people coming over, okay, for the opportunities that are, that are there that are not there in Europe, right? Especially the chance to just have land. Um, you have a higher birth rate among colonists, which we'll talk a little bit about later. And um, there's just an abundance of food, you know. I mean, you got stable uh, trade networks going to the Americas, uh, from Europe, um, so it's it's not as dangerous as it used to be back in the early days of Jamestown. Um, so, so yeah, I mean, things are really starting to change in the colonies and also the way of life. So besides the many immigrants that came from Britain, Scotland, Wales, Ireland, um, many also came from Western and Central Europe. So many immigrants that came were mostly Protestant from the Kingdom of France and various German-speaking sta states. Many immigrants fled for religious freedom due to the persecution or from the war-torn countries in Europe. Remember that religion is still a very big thing going on in Europe right now. They're still kind of unsettled from the whole Protestant Reformation, which tore uh, you know Europe apart with many different wars that went on, including the Thirty Years' War. So, um, you know, all these things, you know, just people want to look for a better life, one that's probably more opportunistic and less, less uh, political. Um, eventually, you know, just politics all around you just sort of, you know, becomes the mind numbing and, you know, maybe even kind of feel that way in this country now, who knows, but it's, uh, you know, so people are trying to get away for a new life, a new fresh start. Many hope to find the economic means, uh, for opportunity as farmers, artisans, and merchants in, in the colonies. Immigrants settled in the middle colonies of Pennsylvania, New York, New Jersey, Maryland, and Delaware. Um, many also settled in the western frontiers of Georgia, Carolinas, and uh, and Virginia. So uh, immigrants are coming everywhere, and um, and uh, the 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 allure of freedom and having land is just too powerful of a of a, a notion to pass up. So we have ethnic migrations happening. Um, of course, you got English, and they're spreading all over the 13 colonies. You got Germans who are coming over. They're going to come over and uh, far, you know, have uh, farmlands west of Philadelphia um, in a place known as Pennsylvania Dutch Country. And this is going to be a place where a lot of like 
they're going to bring a lot of their own things, right? Like the German language will be spoken. You got customs of, of German customs. You got religions such as Lutherans. You got Amish coming over, brethren, and Mennonites, uh, many of which are still around today. They obeyed colonial law but cared little for politics. So, um, you know, you have people who just kind of want to live, live in their own community, you know, worship God the way they want. But politics is, isn't really their, their thing. About 6% of the population uh, by 1775 is, is going to be from Germans. Then you got the Scottish-Irish. They're also eventually going to be known as the Scots-Irish. These are people who are English-speaking. They're from, they're, they're Irish, right? Um, they're Protestant. They came from Northern Ireland. Uh, their ancestors have moved from Scotland to Ireland. Uh, so these are people that eventually from Ireland are going to head over to uh, the colonies. They didn't like the British very much. Okay, They felt like the British pressured them to leave Ireland. Most of these immigrants settled along the frontier of western Pennsylvania, Virginia, Carolinas, Georgia. They're going to make up about 7%. So Scots-Irish is an important term to remember. Over Europe, other Europeans, we got French Protestants. They're, also, they're known as Huguenots. They're going to be coming over for religious freedom. They're followers of John Calvin, if you remember, very similar to like the, uh, the Puritans who kind of come from, from Calvin, so do um, the separatists. You got the Dutch that are going to be coming over. You got the Swedes who are going to be coming. I mean, you know, a lot of people see a lot of lot of opportunity here, and they, they want to take advantage of it. So that will be about 5% of the population. Of course, uh, the largest population that didn't come by choice would be enslaved Africans. Um they worked as slaves in the fields of the plantations. By 1775, they made up 20% of the colonial population. Most lived in southern colonies with the majority in South Carolina and Georgia, which would be some of the bigger places where plantation um, will, will, will continue to thrive, especially like in things like uh, indigo and, and rice, etc. Uh, we got American Indians. So we got colony, uh, colonials, you know, coming over. They're starting to expand. They're starting to crowd and, and impede on borders with uh, Native American Indians. That's going to lead to conflict. Um, some American Indians formed alliances, protect their land. And so we have the Powhatan, the, po the Powhatan, sorry, the Powhatan Confederation in Virginia and the Iroquois Confederation and the Great Lakes. So here are examples where you see Indian tribes sort of building alliances to try to somehow resist the growing uh, expansion of the colonists. So others used European settlers as allies in the conflict with other Native American tribes. William Penn... He was especially noted for, um, for gaining land through treaty rather than violence. He did this, in, especially in Delaware, which is kind of, it, it was originally a part of Pennsylvania, but Delaware is like the, 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 um, the southeast portion of it becomes Delaware. It was made up of like three districts in Pennsylvania. But William Penn is going to kind of strike a, some kind of a, a treaty with them and he's going to gain that land, uh, not through violence or through intimidation, but through cooperation. So, uh, but, you know, the Powhatan um, um, Confederation, the Iroquois Confederation, there are important things to understand uh, as, as a response to, to the growing colonists' um, imposition on, on the, uh, the natives' borders. So we got liberty and opportunity happen here, happening here. Religious, toler, religious toleration is, uh, is a pretty big one, but it's not the same in all states. Um, we're going to see varying degrees of freedom. For example, Massachusetts, which will have, be the most restrictive, they're going to accept all Protestants. So Massachusetts, if you're a Protestant, you're welcome, but it's going to exclude Roman Catholics and all non-Christians like Jews, for example. 
Rhode Island and Pennsylvania, now they're going to be a lot more open to other people, other groups, other beliefs. They're going to accept all those who believe in God, including Jews. However, only Christians could participate in government. So again, there is a stipulation there. Um, but there's no like hereditary aristocracy. There's 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 no um, the heredity of it all is just that that was in Europe, you know, from father to son, and th that's not going to really be a thing because the the colonies are are still very new, and they're they're creating their own identity separate from Europe, and basically they're trying to create an identity that things they didn't like from Europe is, is slowly what they're trying to create while still being over the banner uh, uh, of, of the British crown, right? But within that, they're trying to create something that, that, is, that is more attractive to them than the, the quid pro quo and the status quo of Europe. So no, there was no emerging narrow class system of wealthy landowners at the top with craft work and at, so we have craft works of, of people, and then we have at the bottom, we have small farmers, which made up most of the population. Most of the population coming to the Americas will be people that have farms that are, you know, less than 50 acres or so. I think that's later on here. Um, in all the colonies, white residents had an opportunity to improve their standing of living and status by hard work. So we call that a meritocracy, right? Where you get rewarded for your hard work, for your merit. You, you earn your place, basically, based on how hard you work, the, the more reward you can get for it. There isn't a whole lot of that in Europe because, again, there's this attitude of, of hereditary um, aristocracy. There, there is very little social mobility where you, if you're poor, you can go to the highest ranks. That, that's not really a thing in Europe. But in America, again, people get to change their stripes, basically, and, and, and start anew. So we have family life, uh, trying to describe to you kind of what, what, what they, how they kind of saw men and women, especially with families, right? So with the stable economy, with stable food supply, you have colonists who married younger and reared more children than in Europe. So over 90% of colonists live on farms. Um, men could own property. They could participate in politics. Uh, the law gave men a, a lot of power. Some would argue unlimited power, and especially in the home, which uh, could also lead to um, them legally being able to beat their wives if they wanted to. Women, um, they bore an average of eight children. Many died at, the, at birth or in infancy. Um, they handled domestic chores, provided medical care, and were the primary educators of, of their children, typically. Um, often worked next to their husband in the shop, on the plantation, or on the farm. Uh, husband and wife were more side-by-side -side in, their, in their cost of living and in their um, occupations. Divorce was legal, but rare. Women had limited legal and political rights. Shared labors and mutual dependence with their husband gave most women protection from abuse and an active role in decision making. And the economy. So in New England, you have long winters, you have rocky soil, which kind of limits the colonists' ability to farm. So you don't have a whole lot of big plant, you don't have any really big plantations in New England, you know, in Massachusetts. Um, area Connecticut that area um, you got the smaller farms and you got families with these smaller farms just trying to get by okay most are going to be about 100 acres or so um, middle class or middle colonies you got rich soil right so middle colonies would be like New York uh, Pennsylvania uh, things like that right so you got rich soil um, produced an abundance of wheat and corn to export to Europe and West Indies. You have larger farms were common. You have up to about 200 acres there. Indentured servants and hired help was common, especially with helping with families. Manufacturing efforts and iron making led to growth of Philadelphia and New York. And by 1750, yeah, Philadelphia was the, the largest 
city in the colonies of 25,000 people, which doesn't seem like a whole lot nowadays, but I mean, that's pretty significant for, for colonies that are still quite young, you know, in the scope of things. And then you have the southern colonies. Most people lived on small subsistence family farms without slaves in southern colonies. Of course, you have the few, and these are the ones that get more of the, 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 the spotlight shined on them, that lived on plantations of over 2,000 acres and relied heavily on slave labor. Uh, tobacco being grown in the Chesapeake and Northern Carolina was common. Um, you also have timber and naval stores like tar and pitch in the Carolinas. You have rice and indigo in South Carolina and Georgia. So every every region of the 13 colonies, you know, has a, has a plus and a minus kind of, you know, there's pros and cons. Um, and it's important to understand what these pros or cons going forward in AP. So go ahead and write that summary, and we'll discuss it when we come back.